Welcome to The Green Rush, a podcast about the intersection of cannabis, the capital markets, and culture. On a weekly basis, hosts Ann Donahoe and Lewis Goldberg of KCSA Strategic Communications speak with the business leaders, financial experts, cultural icons, legislators, and generally interesting people moving the cannabis industry forward. This week's episode is actually another one that Ann and Lewis recorded from the floor of the Cannabis World Congress and Business Expo in Los Angeles just a few weeks back. In this episode, they chat with Ken Alston, the CEO of Hydroponics Inc., a technology-enabled provider of global agricultural supplies, data and analytics, and procurement for large-scale commercial cannabis farms. Think the oh-so-sexy topic of supply chain logistics. Actually, the conversation is a cool one as they dive into some of the economics behind cultivation. So don't sit back, lean forward. Now on to the conversation. Hi, happy Green Rushers and Donahoe here. So as Shay said, this episode was recorded at the Cannabis World Congress in LA, and that's why you'll hear some hubbub in the background. We often talk on this podcast about the need for professionalization of this industry in order for it to really grow in a meaningful way. And a key component of that is supply chain management and logistics, which, you know, these are the types of services that are table stakes in every other industry in the world, but really not for cannabis yet. So Ken Austin from Hydroponics Inc., Inc. Hydroponics Inc. walks us through how companies like his are working to help cultivators really do what they do best, which is grow great cannabis and hemp. He just helps them grow more efficiently, which translates into saving them real money. So without further ado, here is our chat with Ken Alston of Hydroponics. So Anne, day two, Cannabis World Congress Business Expo, downtown LA Convention Center. It's quiet. You have to deal with me yet again face to face. No, you're leaving at lunch, so. I am leaving at lunch. There's an end in sight. But then I'm going to come back. Oh, okay. (laughs) We are taping this, as I said, day two um, at the Cannabis World Congress and Business Expo. Um, Today is September 27th, and we are witnessing the President of the United States have a complete and total meltdown on Twitter which one would never have Didn't thought Didn't know we were happen. going there? Oh, we're going to go wherever. Okay. With me, you don't know where we're going to go. Um, we are joined by Ken Alston from Hydroponics, Inc., which, full disclosure, is one of KCSA's clients. It's a new client and has quickly rocketed to the top as among our favorite clients. Um, <laughs> and Ken is one of the coolest guys in the industry because you don't actually come from the cannabis industry, Ken. Tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get into this space? Sure. Uh, thank you guys for having me. This is my first podcast. <gasps> oh, as we'll a, be gentle. As an introvert, it's very difficult for me to be public on this. Um, so, yeah, my background originally was in private equity. And then a partner and I were more passionate about operating businesses. And we engaged and embarked on a uh, entrepreneurial journey through the search fund model, which is where you get a group of folks, um, high net worth individuals, to support your search to go out and identify and acquire existing businesses, buy them, run them, create... Basically a SPAC, but not a public SPAC. Correct. Yeah, it's a derivative of that. Um, So long story short, we were focused predominantly in insurance services and the healthcare environment. The interesting thing about both platforms that we ran, uh, one was... uh, in workers' compensation, which was undergoing tremendous legislative and regulatory change, which creates opportunity. The second platform was undergoing legislative and regulatory change because of the Affordable Care Act. So both of those platforms allowed us to disrupt kind of the business as usual and create some pretty favorable uh, trends and uh, shareholder value. So after the last run, it with the medical company um we were doing private investing had no interest in ever operating a business again i had sat in enough human resources meetings in my day um so it was having a blast right so we have a small family office uh where we would just make private investments across different platforms and then in the fall of 2017 like a lot of people in the investment community specifically in california um 
folks were discussing how they were going to participate in um, the legalization of recreational cannabis in California. So, you know, it was interesting to me in that you have an industry that is growing faster than telecom in the early 90s. Um, I also recognize, because my grandpa was a farmer, that agriculture is incredibly challenging, right? And I don't know the first thing about agriculture. Where was he a farmer? Western Kentucky, outside of Paducah. Tobacco. I love Paducah. Have you been there? I have. Yeah. In, in 1996 with President Clinton, it was the very first campaign rally I ever did for him. Kentucky Oak Mall. Yes. Yes. Went to a lot Were of Were you there? There. <laughs> When Clinton was there? <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. Were you born there? No, I was born in Illinois. Okay. And then moved very early on to Houston and then landed in California in the mid 80s. Never looked back. Well, never. Yes. I mean, I, I consider California my home. I've lived elsewhere. But anyway, so um, we're having a lot of fun. People are coming to us. We're talking to people. We're going to think tanks. We're going to VC meetings. <laughs> Um, how people are going to participate in recreational cannabis and the legalization thereof. And um, we came to the conclusion very quickly on that we did not have the risk appetite to touch the flower, so to speak. But if anything tangential came, al came along that serviced cultivators, that's something that we would find compelling, right? Um, never and I assume you also recognize that at some point the flower was just going to be a commodity, right? That the the margins would compress dramatically and that serving those people who grow is a better business than actually growing. In our opinion. In, right. So, opinion. Um, you know, as an aside, so let's just kind of touch on that subject before I walk you through where, how we ended up with hydroponic sink. So what's happened, in our opinion, and you guys are experts at this, but the vast majority of the dollars that have come in over the last, call it, five years, uh, was really kind of a barbell, right? So on one side, you have a tremendous amount of money coming into cultivation, right? And then the other side of the spectrum, you have a lot of money coming into the dispensary or brand building side, right? But w between those two barbells, right, there's a lot of services happening that have not attracted dollars, have not att attracted sophisticated institutional money. That inevitably will happen. It's just a matter of time. Uh, the sexiness of cultivation, the sexiness of being a prominent brand obviously has attracted the money initially. Um, you know, I, I, I think having lived through a couple different economic cycles, specifically the dot-com, bubble and then um, being present for the Great Recession, I think inevitably we're going to see normalization of these valuations. It's happening right it's now. It's happening right now. Uh, you know, Q2, uh, Q3, 19 investment dollars in cannabis are down significantly from the same period in 2018. Um, eventually, which everybody knows, but um, you have to make a profit at some point, right? <laughs> And uh, well, how long did it take Amazon? 20 years? Slightly different, slightly different. But, um, you know, just like any other industry that's going through an emergence, um, you're going to have a shakeout where there's only going to be a few leaders. Right. And then there'll, there'll be niches and things like that. So anyway, long story short, we never thought about what we were going to do. Uh, and then we said, OK, if something tangential comes along, provides services to cultivators we'll take a look at it and that could have been anything from insurance services to you name it and hydroponics inc came across our desk um in march of 2018 and it was very interesting right so here was a company that had a very strong reputation for california cultivators they had done some work in other states to a lesser extent washington colorado some work in canada but minor but in terms of the california community really had a strong reputation um and we thought okay well here's an opportunity really to come in um and disrupt the supply chain right um ultimately if you think about it from a ceo's perspective who runs a cultivation or 
multiple state operation, right? You want as few problems as possible. And you also want as highly professional partners as possible. And there was nobody doing what, what we are now doing today nationally within the supply chain, which is, look, we are moving supplies across 15 states, D.C., soon to be Puerto Rico, against the backdrop of a technology-enabled platform, and everything is data-driven, right? Everything that we do. and Which adds to predictability, which adds to yeah. guaranteed outcomes. I mean, that's, that's what, if you're in an agricultural industry, you want to know inputs, outputs. Especially one so heavily regulated yeah. as this. A hundred percent. Right. And so we so taking a step back, we identified that we could do something interesting with hydroponic sink. Um, and at that point, what did it look like? Because you guys had store they had storefronts, but then they had. Um, yeah, you know, corporate it was accounts. it was it still predominantly was retail, but it did have uh, thirty three thousand square feet in the Riverside County, which is a major distribution center for Southern California. Uh, Lewis and I were talking about the Port of Long Beach. That is a huge distribution center. You have Riverside County, which is Amazon's out there. You have the FedEx terminals. It's pretty massive, and you can service Los Angeles very quickly and efficiently and cheaply, as well as um, other parts of the country, right? And so we took a look at it, and we said, there's some interesting things that we can do here. They were starting to move on to the commercial side, um, but not to the not to the extent where we are today. Why was the company for sale? So the company was for sale because the founder, uh, who had done a very good job, um, wanted to move into cultivation. We identified hydroponics and it came across our desk. The founder of Hydro, which we call it, um, had been doing it for 10 years, you know? I mean, he got you reach a certain point where it's always difficult to understand why someone sells something, right? And having done this for almost 20 years, um, you know, I've sold things which didn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, people get burned out, right? And then you also have other opportunities and you just want a new chapter in your life. Right. Um, so we ended up buying the company in July 18 and it's been an absolute rocket ship since then. Um, I, so what we did uh, is we focused again on where can we be the most disruptive and create the most shareholder value, right? And where is the biggest need? And so again, getting back to the barbell situation, all the money is coming into cultivation to a lesser extent on the dispensary brand side. Right. Guys, how are you going to how are you going to run billion dollar companies? with a crummy supply chain manager. The days of, well, let's just take a step back. If you have 200,000 acres of corn, right, or alfalfa, or where my grandpa's from, Western Kentucky, soybeans, and you need something for your farm, you're not sending John or Jane down to the country store to pick up something. Right. You have a relationship with a commercial vendor, right, service reps. There are, there's just an entire system to it. And it's so well understood, the life cycle of these crops, that these service reps know when to be bringing you what in that life cycle. Yeah, and also the economic inputs that you put into your cultivation site mm -hmm. are pretty expensive, right? It's about 20 cents on the dollar. Okay. Okay, so excluding infrastructure build, which is dehumidifiers, rolling benches, lights. I'm talking about the recurring maintenance, right? And it's plus or minus. And that, that applies in cannabis as well? I'm No, I'm talking specifically about so cannabis. So 20 cents on the dollar. Plus is, or minus. Right. Yeah. So the way that we figured out, we think we're, we're, we think we're really clever guys, right? And gals. And uh, we run all these fancy algorithms and financial models to figure out exactly what a farm will yield or generate in recurring revenue for someone like us. And it comes out to about a buck a square foot. Okay. okay. So sometimes it's 80, sometimes it's a dollar 12, but that's basically where it comes out. Okay. And so what that means globally speaking is for every dollar that a cultivator generates in revenue, about 20 cents on the dollar goes to cultivation expenses, supplies, and the nutrients. Awesome. Now, ultimately, those the, some of those numbers will decrease because a lot of these guys are mimicking big ag best practices with the nutrients. Nutrients is the single largest economic input 
Okay. And what's interesting about that, just as an aside, is that uh, Anna and I were talking about this earlier this week, is that we have just engaged with a PhD uh, who has a degree from UCI in organic chemistry who is joining Hydroponics Inc. next week. And we'll be doing kind of our own academic think tanks within our company to look at the efficacy of different nutrients across the country, which we think will ultimately help our guys save money, right? Which we already know that we're saving them 30 cents on the dollar, uh, or let me rephrase, 30% than what they would be doing if they weren't using hydroponics. So if, if a, a commercial grower has a relationship with his or her local hydro store, and they do, they, they need more fertilizer, they will run to the store, and if they are doing that as a just-in-time cost, by working with you, you can save them 30%. So here are the, here are the inputs. Um, and then I want to get back a little bit to how we worked with Hy- hydroponics Inc. through the transaction and then why that's applicable for and how we're we going to deploy. Can we also talk about also, uh, you know, there's a, there is a level of, of distrust, distrust is the wrong word, but for historic market participants, Looking at guys who come out of PE, you know, we, Ann and I talk about this tension between the suits and the stoners. Your company has real depth and experience in working with some of the most well-known Southern California growers. So talking about those relationships as well would be interesting. So um, we refer to that as legacy management. Mm -hmm. Um. And so, yeah, there's 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 challenges, right? Because you have two different cultures. You have folks who have dedicated the vast majority of their life, or certainly the professional career, to cannabis cultivation, right? And effective January first, two thousand eighteen, specifically for California and other dates for other jurisdictions, you now are attracting people who have not dedicated their entire life to cultivation of cannabis and so there is going to be some friction that exists and um, you just have to work through it I mean there's certainly cha- there's some challenges that exist but uh, you know at hydroponic sync we kind of marry the two so one of the things that we did when we acquired the company you just look at where the numbers are right so the largest number that we generate is our revenue and the second largest number is our cost of goods sold which is the supplies that we generate on behalf of or we purchase on behalf of our clients right and we whacked the hell out of it and basically tripled it our earnings in 12 months not from anything that we did that was spectacular because those days are over right it's low-hanging fruit but we brought in people who spent their career in procurement and data so like the dude who runs our data used to run $8 billion of inventory at Ford, you know, Harvard MBA type guy. Um, The gal who runs kind of the day-to-day procurement for us, you know, former investment banker, worked for a very large family-owned company, $100 million plus, uh, where they were doing uh, private labeling for alcohol um, products and brands, three-time NCAA champion. I mean, these are the type of people that we're bringing in. Right. Because, look, at the end of the day, we're not a sexy business. We're not a sexy industry. And I don't want to be, right? We're sober individuals here who are here to make money uh, for the cultivators. We want them to be as efficient and lean as possible. So sometimes when we ch- chat with people, and I'll circle back to the legacy, it's it's mind-blowing that not every single person in the United States uses hydroponic sink. Like, who in the hell else would you have? Who would you partner with? Well, can you so let me real quickly. So, but geographic proximity to a local hydroponic retailer um, historically has been the partner for a lot of the farms. And it's hard to disrupt, you know, a personal relationship because you're going in so frequently, right? Well, and there was so much trust built there because of the nature of of what this industry has been for the last year. So, but look at it this way. You can't be everything to everybody. So if you are a 5,000 square foot licensed farm, keep going to your little retailer, right? Uh, And that's great. But if you are a multi-state operator who's running other people's money or you're publicly traded, I mean, you you need to have the same level of sophistication commensurate with what you're doing on the cannabis side. And it's pretty amazing that all of the MSOs are not working with either you or a company like yours. And and I understand that there are not many true national competitors in this space. 
But the guys who put these MSOs together are very sophisticated financial operators, right? They are not legacy cannabis market participants. These are guys who came from Wall Street, who ran hedge funds, who ran private equity funds, who ran other people's money. Right. They should be linearly focused on the bottom line. And, and you know, many of them will describe the experience. And we've used this analogy often of it's building the plane as they fly it. So they're not always looking at where all the costs of the inputs are. They're only looking at what's the next license I can get What's the next company I can buy as opposed to how do I maximize the return on what I already have? Can, as we were discussing with the, the, the sophistication of the, the current MSOs and their financial background, can you talk about some of the people who Hydroponics is working with um, and what the impact that you've had on their business? Yeah, so let's start regionally and then I'll talk about something that we're really proud of. Um, on a national level. So regionally, as, as you guys know, and as I mentioned, so we were founded in Riverside County, which is uh, a spectacular place to have been founded for cannabis cultivation. And fast forward to 2019, um, we have a lot of folks with whom we work in Palm Springs, which is a major cannabis hub for cultivation in the state of California. And we have, uh, dear, dear client partner there called Gentleman's Cut, who's um, running up to 196,000 square feet. So it's 14, 14,000 square feet. Um, I mean, it looks like a, you know, it looks like a college campus and they're excellent operators, st- just excellent. And so we've grown with them. They are on the recur- intended. Yes. Uh, we've grown with them, right? Since the first building, uh, You know, as then they embark on the continuation of getting the 14 in place, which I think will be December 2020. Massive undertaking, very sophisticated on the business side, very sophisticated on the cultivation side. What we've done for them, though, real time procurement, real time logistics, analysis, data. So that's a partnership. On the national scale, something we're really proud about, which just started in the summer, and I'll just use it as an example because it's it's illustrative of some of the other things we're doing is we work now exclusively with Columbia care, which is in multiple States. And so here's an, here's an example. This is just intellectually and academically. This is where I, uh, I'm very proud of what we do and it's just interesting. So if you are running an MSO, um, and I'm not talking about Columbia care, but I'll move into that. You're running an MSO. Let's say you're in 10 States. Okay, you can't have 10 different cultivators making 10 different procurement supply decisions. Well, you can. It's just going to be really inefficient. It's super inefficient. How do you budget? How do you budget? Mm -hmm. Okay, and you need to constantly be moving toward a homogeneous platform. Okay. Now, I understand that if you are making acquisitions, sometimes you're going to inherit a greenhouse that the ventilation is not as great as the other greenhouse, and you're going to have to run kind of different recipes on a monthly basis, but you can still streamline your procurement. And you really need to have, at the end of the day, basically one person running that procurement cycle. And we do that. So we're a third-party administrator for these guys. So Columbia Care is really exciting because we've streamlined it with our vice president of horticulture, um, who very, very sharp guy, where we have created a pre-populated menu for all their cultivators across all these states. And you can deviate slightly, but what it does is it brings continuity and a seamlessness to that process. What does it do for the product? More, more consistency, right? You can't, you want to decrease variability with your product, right? And so that's an idea of where you can save a tremendous amount of money. And not to mention where we talked about it at one point, given our purchasing power in the community, let's say you didn't even use our data, our analytics, our phenomenal procurement team, just given our purchasing power. And again, we're product agnostic. So we'll go to anybody, right? Um, You're going to save 21 to 22 cents just off the bat given our purchasing power right the other eight cents nine cents comes from the elimination of ftes that are part of an internal procurement department etc etc and then making better decisions on the prescriptive analytics 
um, I want to talk for a second about um, the $75 million fund that we've announced for you guys. Um, can you talk a little bit about why um, why you guys are doing that, what, what you're looking to do with that money, um, and the next step? That's my favorite question. <laughs> so, and, and, and Wait, Anne asked your favorite question? Well, of course I, I, I love both you guys. Um, let's get back to hydroponic sink and, uh, and to segue into that. We made an incredibly modest investment in hydroponic sink. Uh, we are a diverse group of LPs, right? Um, limited partners. Limited partners, some very prominent folks, very prominent family offices. And we dipped our toe in the water, right? Um, not from an operational or time spent on the endeavor. Um, you know, as they say, I'm kind of working like I'm broke here. It's like 80 hours a week. But... Um, we made a modest investment in hydroponic sink, and we are thrilled. So given what's happening now across the board, right, we are seeing normalization of valuations, which is good, right? Um, I, 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 if you're a publicly traded company, I would argue that they're thinking, oh, shit, not it's good, but yes. <laughs> yeah, I would have. I also I, want to talk about your decision to stay private. I would have loved to have owned, yeah. In a a well, certain yeah. type of publicly traded cannabis company 14 months ago versus today. Totally. Uh, well, one I of our board members was in that position. So um, we dipped our toe in the water with hydroponic sink. It was a modest investment. We have a phenomenal group. I mean, it's 20 plus entities, individuals, notable CEOs, family offices. And we came to the realization, let's go for it. Like, let's really build this into our Cargill. Now you pushed your chips all in. Um, I wouldn't say we pushed all of our chips in, but we pushed a, a meaningful percentage of them. And we came to the conclusion we want to be a supply chain manager at a global level, right? And we want to be the Cargill for cannabis cultivation. And I think given the lack of competition we have at this stage on the national level, we have a big runway. Now, clearly, like in any other industry, competition will come in, right? Because mm -hmm. you're... It, just they're going to chase Maybe margins. Car Cargill might get in. Yeah. And, you know, I can give them my address. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, to the fund. So we just made the decision, look, we're going to deploy a lot more money over the next 12 to 24 months mm -hmm. into the supply chain. So, you know, what's funny is we did that press release and you know, we've already done something interesting and we're going to be doing some interesting things. Um, the vast majority of people who contact us are cultivators. So for the cultivators out there, please don't contact us. It's well, about the supply well, chain. No, contact if you want supply chain not to be acquired. Correct. Correct. So we're looking forward to it. And, you know, we really do want to stick in our lane, right? And I was having this conversation with the crew this morning, which is, I think, encompasses the entire conversation. Let's have everybody within cannabis, like most mature industries, let's have them stay in their lane and focus on their comparative advantage, right? Like our comparative advantages, we're data guys, we're procurement guys. Why, if you're a multi-state operator that cultivates cannabis, do you want to futz around with the supply chain? You don't. We don't want to touch the flower. I mean, that's crazy. Like, let's all stay in our lane, focus on what we're good at. Do you think you guys are early? I mean, this industry, you know, many people say it's the first inning, second inning, or third inning. You're, you're working with Columbia Care. You are pitching to other MSOs. Are they sophisticated? You know, even though these are sophisticated, and this is going to have to be our last question, but even though these are sophisticated financial operators, are they ready for you, or are you, are you six months or 12 months too soon? I've wanted to say this publicly for a long time. A dear friend of mine and a mentor taught me that, you know, another way of saying you're early is you're also wrong, right? Because you got to have the capital and the balance sheet to withstand that duration from being early to when the market starts to resonate with your product or service, right? Yep. Um, Columbia Care is a, a special example, and there's 
other folks like that. But no, they're they're incredibly sophisticated guys and gals who just appreciate our value proposition. Um, I think a lot of other people um, are probably six months to twelve months away from saying it's time to. Well, let's take, let's take a step back and we'll conclude with this. As a CEO of a company, any industry, any service, what are you focused on initially as you're building your company? Revenue. Yeah. Once you start hitting your revenue projections, then you start going down the income statement, right? Yes. So now they're going to start moving. Once they start building their brand, they're getting resonance, they start making some profits, their team is going to start looking at their cost of goods sold, okay, and their SG&A, and that's when they'll call us. Awesome. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, guys. This is great. By the way, if people want to reach out to you, where can they find uh, Hydroponics and where can they find you? They can find all of our information at hydroponicsinc.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ken. Thanks, thank you, Ken. guys. Our thanks to Ken Austin from Hydroponics Inc. You can find them online at hydroponicsinc.com and on Instagram at Hydroponics Inc. As always, if you want to chat with us, you can find us on Twitter at the underscore Green Rush or Instagram at the Green Rush underscore podcast or drop us an email at greenrush at kcsa.com. We are always looking for feedback and guest ideas. And don't forget to subscribe to the Green Rush in your favorite podcatcher. One take, Shay. One take.